Welcome to Unveiling Physics. In this episode, we'll be discussing the acceleration and interactions of ultra-high energy cosmic rays. The physics of ultra-high energy cosmic rays is of great interest in particle physics and astrophysics. First, cosmic rays can have energies up to 10 to the 19 EV, much larger than what we can achieve with particle accelerators here at Earth. Thus, their interactions with the nucleons in the atmosphere can probe QCD to unexplored energy ranges. Second, the objects that can accelerate particles up to 10 to the 19 EV are of great astrophysical interest. In fact, the objects that can accelerate particles to this extent are currently unknown. Some of the candidates for these are active galactic nuclei and gamma ray bursts. The reason the sources of these cosmic rays are still unknown is because of these high energies, particles, mostly protons and other heavier nuclei, get deflected by the galactic and intergalactic magnetic fields. Hence, their arrival direction does not point back to their sources, whereas neutrinos and photons do point back to their sources. However, photons are more likely to interact and undergo electromagnetic cascades as they propagate towards Earth. Moreover, photons can be produced with both electromagnetic and hadronic processes, whereas neutrinos can only be produced with hadronic processes. Thus, photons and neutrinos can provide complementary information for the sources of cosmic rays and the search of ultra-high energy cosmic rays. So let's discuss how charged particles are accelerated in astrophysical sources, and then let's see how the interactions of these charged cosmic rays can produce ultra-high energy neutrinos. So how does acceleration happen? If we take a look at Zwicky's conjectures from 1934, first we need heavy enough stars to collapse at the end of their lives into supernovae. Then, implosions produce explosions of cosmic rays. And third, they leave behind neutron stars. So let's talk about some general constraints on cosmic accelerators. First, geometry. The accelerated particle should be maintained within the object during the acceleration process. Next, power. The source should be able to provide the necessary energy for the accelerated particles. Then, we have radiation losses. Within the accelerating field, the energy gained by a particle should be no less than its radiation energy loss. Interaction losses. The energy lost by a particle due to its interaction with other particles should not be greater than its energy gain. Then emissivity. The density and power of sources must be enough to account for the observed ultra-high energy cosmic ray flux. And finally, coexisting radiation. The accompanying photon and neutrino flux and the low energy cosmic ray flux should not be greater than the observed fluxes. Then we can think of the requirements for possible sources of cosmic ray acceleration, like the Hill's confinement, or the magnetic field and dimensions need to be sufficient to contain the accelerating particles. Here, it is defined that the radius of the source needs to exceed the Larmo radius, and so we can get an expression for the maximum energy our cosmic rays can have depending on the radius of the source and the magnetic field. To visualize this, here we have a plot of the different type of sources for cosmic ray accelerations and how they depend on their commoving size or radius and their magnetic field strength. Here, this blue line represents the Hillis criterion requirement, and everything above this blue line can be considered a source for cosmic ray acceleration. We also have some energy reference scales. For example, the energy of a neutrino coming from a cosmic ray is about a 20th of the proton energy. So if we see neutrinos of two PEV ranges, then these neutrinos can be coming from cosmic ray sources with energies of 10 to the 17 EV. So what is the physical mechanism of these cosmic ray accelerations? 
In 1948, Enrico Fermi came up with a theory to explain cosmic ray acceleration. So let's consider an astrophysical gas cloud permeated by stochastic magnetic fields, meaning that at any point of this moving cloud, the magnetic field can be in any direction. And we'd like to think about the scenario where a moving particle comes in with some velocity and exits the cloud with another. Well, in the frame of the cloud, there's no change in energy and the outgoing direction is random. So let's consider some cases. First, when the particle does not change direction. Two, when we have head-on collisions. And three, where we have rear-end collisions. In the first case, the outgoing particle velocity is parallel to the incoming one. This is not the case for the second and third. Then for head-on collisions, the particle's velocity is not parallel to the cloud's velocity direction whereas rear-end collisions are both parallel. So we can work with a relativistic model where the energies in the cloud frame remain the same. Now we can write a Lorentz transformation. So we can transform to the left frame and get the outgoing energy. And thus, we can write a fractional change in energy in the lap frame as such. However, this is for a particular direction. We need to average over all values. So if we consider a random walk inside the cloud so that each outgoing direction is equally likely, then assuming incoming particles are also isotropically distributed, we can compute the number of particles reaching the cloud per interval dt. This can be related to the probability per unit angle. Then we obtain the average values and thus we get an equation for the averaged fractional energy change. Finally, we have to find the second order Fermi acceleration equation where the fractional energy change is proportional to beta square. Now beta is always positive and beta is also very small, therefore, the average energy gain is small. Let's take a look at this example. Let's assume that we have cloud that's moving with a velocity of 10 kilometers per second. That would mean that the energy gain is on the order of 10 to the minus 8. However, the typical distance between gas clouds is on the order of light years so that the total duration of a typical acceleration process is of the order of 10 to the 8 years. That's a long time. Let's consider now a spherical shock wave rather than random clouds, for example, from a supernova remnant. So how would cosmic rays get accelerated? The most efficient known mechanism for accelerating particles involves shock waves moving through plasma. Charged particles ping-pong back and forth across the shock front, gaining speed each time. The shock wave creates turbulence in the plasma's magnetic field. The fast-moving field reflects the particle like a bat hitting a baseball. Some particles get reflected over and over, accelerating to enormous speeds. So, considering the diffuse shock acceleration, we can define the first order of Fermi acceleration. This time, the fractional energy change is proportional to beta, so the average gain is much larger than the second order. Let's bring back this plot. If we now define the maximum energy our cosmic rays can be accelerated from the shock acceleration, here we have some guidelines depending on the composition of our cosmic rays. So what type of interactions can we expect from these cosmic rays? First, we have the photopair production. When we have our protons from our cosmic rays interacting with CMB photons and producing an electron pair. Then we have the photopion production. 
where our cosmic ray interacts with CMB photons and hadronically produces either a charge or neutral pion. Let's take a further look. The production rate of charged ultra high energy cosmic rays, mainly protons in the universe, can be defined as so. So we want to ask ourselves, how many neutrinos can we expect from these sources? From photopion productions, we can see that the charged pions can also decay and produce neutrinos. The energy density in muon neutrinos today can be defined as so, where it depends on different factors. For example, these one half factors come from the branching ratios of charge to neutral pions and also the branching ratio of the charged pion having enough energy to produce the muon neutrinos. Then we have this epsilon factor that is the average fraction of the proton energy that is lost in these interactions. And finally, the inverse of H0 is simply the Hubble time. With these equations, we can obtain an upper bound on the muon neutrino flux. This is often called the waxman bacall bound. Constructing these bounds can be quite useful when it comes to interpreting the data that we see today. Here we have a plot of the flux from different sources, but let's focus on the neutrino flux in yellow. We can see that the majority of these data points lie within the waxman bacall bounds. Is this a coincidence or can the neutrinos observed at Ice Cube be coming from cosmic rays? So far, we have been able to identify or classify different types of neutrinos. For example, accelerator neutrinos, cosmic neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, and now cosmogenic neutrinos. These cosmogenic neutrinos lie on the very high energy end of our spectrum, often called the GCK neutrinos. These neutrinos are coming from interactions between cosmic rays and CMB photons. And so far, we have yet to detect any of these ultra high energy neutrinos. Let's wrap up the video with some take home messages. We discussed how we can accelerate cosmic rays in astrophysical environments. These cosmic rays can then produce interactions and produce different particles like neutrinos. Now to be considered neutrino sources, there must be sufficient energy budget, which is generally okay since we're talking about 10 to the 19 EUV and so on. And for a sense of completeness, we discussed how the ice cube neutrino flux is within the bounds of the waxman bacall bound. Now this might be a coincidence or there might be some common source behind ultra high energy cosmic rays and these high energy neutrinos. I hope this serves as a motivation to continue pursuing these ultra high energy cosmic rays and the physics that we can learn from them. Until next time.